the campaign last year, um, our a librarian and Wikimedian Sophie Reverdy co-organized the Abortion in Maryland Editathon alongside with the Baltimore Abortion Fund. Uh, and this event was, it was so many things that we were excited about. It was a training on information activism. It was a fundraiser for the local abortion fund. It brought together scholars from various institutions in the Baltimore area. So really coming together in this exciting collaboration of solidarity uh, across cultural institutions and kind of like, that was very, very exciting. Oh, also the event took place in a local anarchist bookstore and benefited uh, the local abortion fund. So just so many things about it are really exciting, really relevant to this year's campaign theme of solidarity. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to invite these fine folks to have a conversation today about really like what they did, how they did it, and then also to be in conversation with all of you about what kind of questions are surfacing for you from this example of an event that took place. So with that, I'd love to hand it over to Sophie. You. I just want to, um, this was like a, a project that was uh, really special to me, but um, I would call my collaborators my, you know, equal or, or we're equal in the organizing process. So it was really all of our, our, our doing. Um, and actually the idea came from my, my dear friend, Alicia. So Alicia and I are going to share a little bit about where that came from. Um, I'm going to share my screen. This is Sophie. Um, yes. Okay. So can everyone see my screen right now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'll start off and then I'll hand it over to you, Alicia. Um, we, uh, so I mentioned Alicia um, is a dear friend of mine. Um, she knows that I'm, I've been active with um, art and feminism. I'm a librarian at a community college in Maryland um, called uh, Anne Arundel Community College um, near our capital, Annapolis. Uh, and I also have worked as, have served as a regional ambassador for the for art and feminism um, for my my area um and so alicia is a historian of medicine um and she um has been surveying wikipedia and noticing some important gaps in information um in her area of expertise her scholarly area of expertise one of one um sort of page that she noticed that needed help um is the was the there's a page um, on um, uh, the his, uh, abortion in Maryland, um, and unfortunately it was uh, lacking um, severely lacking um, good quality state level information, um, and um, she um, was considering um, having her students um, potentially uh, add to this. Um, this article and make it better. Um, and then the idea to have an edit -a sort of evolved from that. Um, and we met some challenges along the way, including um, sort of the lack of uh, published secondary uh, sources dedicated to this topic on a local level, which is incredibly Im important um, in this moment in the United States as uh, we're grappling with the um, uh, the overturning of uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, and um, she, so, so this is something that, that is quite, quite important. Um, so I'm going to hand it to Alicia to talk a little bit more about that. Great. Thank you, Sophie. This is Alicia talking. Um, so uh, I was interested in working on this article, uh, working to improve this Wikipedia article, um, because especially in the wake of the Dobbs decision um, with abortion policy um, fully reverted to the states, uh, 
uh, it's important for people to be able to access accurate information about the state in which they live. Um, and that information uh, on state level policies and on how they've changed over time can be difficult to locate. Um, it's sort of fragmented across different news stories uh, and different organizations. Um, and so when we think about like who is going to search for this topic and wind up seeing the Wikipedia link as like one of the first search results, um, that includes a lot of different use cases. It includes people who are seeking an abortion. Um, it includes people who are concerned about reproductive justice issues and want to understand um, what's happening in their area. And it certainly includes students like the students in my class um, who were trying to learn about the local history of reproductive justice. Um, and for a lot of students, Wikipedia articles are a gateway into um, you know, by clicking on the hyperlinked footnotes are a gateway into finding high quality sources that they can then use to build out their research. So let's check out the next slide, Zubi. Um, And as Alicia was saying, you know, Wikipedia, and I think if you're part of our, uh, the this is Sophie speaking, um, Alicia was saying that uh, if you are, if you're, Part of the Wikipedia um, editing community, um, you know that it it may seem like a niche sort of uh, area of focus, um, but it is the uh, number one search hit um, uh, for most search uh, search engine searches you do. Um, it is the point of access um, for uh, folks that um, don't. Um, have uh, access to like academic research tools um, to uh, sort of start investigating a topic that is of interest to them. Um, and it's all, it is um, the, when in, there's a gap on Wikipedia, that sort of gap in what's uh, represented on, on Wikipedia then reverberates across the internet because Wikipedia is uh, scraped to inform um, other tools like generative AI, right? So um, if you, you probably already know that Wikipedia is a free user-generated collaborative encyclopedia with a strong volunteer editor community who are here today, a lot of them, hello. <laughs> um, and um, in order to, as Alicia was saying earlier, in order to um, publish a uh, on Wikipedia, you have to um, include uh, your sources. So any information should have a, uh, be able to be verified by um, a reliable source, um, which then can lead, um, can help students and, and information seekers, um, uh, you know, find other uh, quality information on the topic. Um, this is just a snapshot of, you know, the first sort of, thing you might see at the top of a Google search, right? So a little snippet from a Wikipedia article. Um, so uh, there are a number of state level uh, abortion pages for the United States um, that were created by um, another project um, uh, that is working to correct the gender gap on Wikipedia. Uh, I'm sure many people in this space are familiar with Women in Red. Um, in 2019, they started to create pages um, for uh, state level information about abortion. Um, and they followed sort of a template that used a lot of national statistics with some customization per state, state level information. Um, so that was uh, quite interesting to discover. Um, and um, it uh, was, it's um, generated some thoughts about how to reproduce our work on the Maryland page for other states. So I'll let um, Alicia talk a little bit about how she discovered, how the state of the abortion in Maryland page when she discovered it. Um, yeah, this is Alicia. Uh, we just have a slide that's in shot of the article that you know I first encountered when I was 
trying to preview what my students were going to find on their internet search, um, which is, uh, you know, the very top part of the Wikipedia article is just this thumbnail summary that is supposed to distill, like, what is the, what are the important, like, top line items in this article. Um, but for the abortion in Maryland page, um, originally it said abortion in Maryland is legal. 64% of adults said in a poll by the Pew Research Center that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. The number of abortion clinics have been declining in recent years. Uh, and then it gives some statistics from 2014. Um, and so we felt that uh, that was that snippet at the top is an opportunity for clear communication of salient information. And so as we, you know, begin to think about improving this page, we were thinking about like, what is the, uh, you know, what are the priorities of communicating here? Um, it might not be so much opinion polling, and it might not be so much this narrative that abortion clinics are declining um, because we don't want to, we want to like focus on like what is actually the content of the article in terms of um, the story of abortion in this area and normalizing abortion as a historical practice. So um, we decided to um, do something about it um, uh, uh, to co sort of combine, sorry, this is Sophie speaking. Alicia and I decided to do something about it, about this um, sort of lackluster page, um, combining our expertise uh, as um, a librarian and um, someone that's involved in the Wikipedia editing community and um, uh, Alicia's scholarly expertise in the history of medicine and her sort of connections to other experts in the field who are, we've got Mary in the room with us today um, and come together and try to um, do some work around this. Uh, so, um, uh, we, um, again, um, we talked a little bit about how, um, Wikipedia, improving Wikipedia is very important. Um, there's some well-documented, um, by, uh, bias, uh, on what's, uh, represented on, on Wikipedia, and, and that matters quite a lot because it is sort of the first, um, place that people, um, go to find information. Um, and uh, Art and Feminism is, uh, again, is an organization that I've been um, uh, working with for a, for a while now. Um, and so we, I knew that Art and Feminism had all these amazing resources um, and people and connections to the larger Wikimedia community. Um, so we were able to leverage those, those resources um, and collaborate with, with Art and Feminism. And then also, um, we um, had some, uh, we we brought in uh, the Baltimore Abortion Fund as well. So it, uh, I think this happened during um, our, our local abortion fund um, has a fundraising um, season uh, and it just sort of coincided during the time that we uh, we're holding this edit-a-thon, so we decided we'll make this um, uh, a fundraiser for for um, Baltimore Abortion Fund. So if you're not familiar with abortion funds, there are um, uh, there's a national federation of abortion funds, and then there are um, local abortion funds that, um, uh, like Baltimore Abortion Fund, use an intersectional reproductive justice lens to dismantle white supremacy and remove systemic barriers uh, for people that um, are trying to access abortion care. And they also have, uh, just like um, Art and Feminism have a really, and Wikipedia, have a really active uh, volunteer community um, that pro provides support services to folks that are, are seeking abortions. So, um, I um, I'll let Alicia talk about um, the 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 experts that um, we invited to join us in these efforts. All right, this is Alicia. Um, so 
we invited a couple of scholars of women, gender, and sexuality uh, from the Baltimore area uh, to both, uh, you know, through our personal networks, but also, again, through looking for resources online. That's actually how I found out um, that we had, you know, a scholar of women's studies who was working on the local history of um, the Planned Parenthood in Baltimore. Um, and then I reached out to her and invited her to join us for this edit-a-thon and to provide um, both to discuss her own work um, and to sort of work with us on finding publicly available resources that we could use um, in our edit-a-thon. Um, and so I think that's something that we can talk about more, but like, uh, you know, local academic experts uh, often do want to share their work with a larger public and especially when they work on an issue like this um, that you know they know is relevant um, and they're very concerned about um, so reaching out can be like scary but it's also um, you'll often find a very receptive audience um, people who want to engage on projects like this Um, so, uh, in January of 2023, we brought together, um, we have a representative, uh, we had a representative of the, um, uh, Baltimore Abortion Fund come and share, um, some information about how to, sorry, this is Sophie speaking. Um, we had a representative of the Baltimore Abortion come to our edit-a-thon and, um, share information about how to, um, write about uh, Wikipedia, um, sort of some language, um, uh, some general like best practices around language uh, use. Uh, we had representation from art and feminism. A uh, local Wikimedian came to help uh, us with more complicated um, Wikipedia editing issues should they arise. Um, and then we had our, our academic experts and we met at um, the great uh, local anarchist bookstore that Kira mentioned earlier, Red Emma's Bookstore and Coffee House. Um, and they uh, donated, they actually donated some of their, a portion of their um, profits from the night to the Baltimore Abortion Fund. Uh, and we had a, a, a donation link, a link to a page where folks could donate uh, to the fund as well. Um, I'll let Alicia talk a little bit about uh, your her the amazing research that she did in preparation of our our work. Yeah, so this is Alicia. Um, because this topic didn't have a lot of uh, published sources that were specifically focused on Maryland or Baltimore reproductive issues. Um, we recognized that we would have to assemble some harder to find sources for um, the volunteer editors to use. Um, so our goals for editing were to add Maryland specific history and policy information um, to get that specialized knowledge out from behind barriers like paywalls. Um, and of course, uh, Wikipedia is not a space for original research, um, but what we could do is collate resources that are hard to find and access um, and direct our volunteer editors to um, you know the chapter or even the page in a larger volume where information specific to Maryland is being discussed. Um, and so the tools that we used for that um, include Internet Archive, which I think as of now still is allowed to host free book loans. I, I'm not sure what the status of that lawsuit is, but um, Internet Archive, uh, you know, not only has public domain books, but um, at least it at that time uh, included free loans of books. Um, and this also includes um, people who have access to paywalled material um, through university subscriptions getting PDFs of those paywalled articles and sharing them with the volunteers attending the event. Um, university library books that we brought with us um, and sharing all of the digital resources on a shared Google Drive um, so that people could access them, especially if they wanted to continue working on the article after the event ended. 
Thanks. And this is just a little information about how we um, marketed or got the word out. Um, we had a little e-flyer that we shared. Um, the Baltimore Abortion Fund, I think, shared it on their social media. Art and Feminism shared it on their social media. Um, we tapped into, um, I'm, I used to volunteer for the Baltimore Abortion Fund, so I have access to the um, volunteer signal group. Um, and I uh, got, uh, I, I reached out to them and a lot of the volunteers showed up. Um, Alicia reached out to our local, um, uh, uh, the Baltimore Democratic, uh, the Baltimore, sorry, I'm having um, a little bit of a brain bubble. The DSA, the, the, the Democratic Socialist uh, Socialists are, are dear friends. Um, and we had some of those folks show up. So um, we just kind of targeted some um, uh, groups that we knew had a stake in the issue. Um, and then we, again, um, sort of had BAF share, the Baltimore Abortion Fund share abortion terminology and best practices. Um, I, on, on behalf of Art and Feminism, I ran a, an editing orientation um, using Art and Feminism's um, teaching tools. Uh, and then we had our, our academic experts um, share uh, some of the sources um, help sort of got uh, direct some of the the areas that, that needed some attention and the sources that would be useful. Um, Mary gave an excellent um, talk about the history of Planned Parenthood in Maryland, um, and it was really great to see um, the our participants working with these historical sources. I think especially for our subject experts. Um, Again, we were raising money for BAF, for the Baltimore Abortion Fund. We um, were able to train a lot of new Wikipedia editors. We were supporting this great coffee house that we all love. Um, and I think one of the things that were was one of the, the most important benefits of, of this for all of us is that we sort of were building those networks of solidarity uh, across different groups um, working on uh, related feminist issues. Um, and we we did make um, a fair amount of, of article revisions. Um, we had we did meet again as a smaller group after uh, the event to sort of clean some things up. Um, this is just a couple of photos um, from the event at Red Emma's. That's Priya giving us a nice talk about um, sharing some language best practices. And um, I guess some of our, our main takeaways that um, were that, you know, I think people feel really empowered uh, editing Wikipedia. I think if you've run an edit-a-thon, you may have um, felt discovered that as well. Um, writing and citing is time intensive. We all know that. Um, some people prefer to get training and then work in like at their home. So some of these things will feel familiar to you if you've ran an edit-a-thon before. Um, it, it's a good idea to consider multiple gatherings if you're working on articles that need a lot of help. And avoiding original research is really difficult in local history because there are there is there aren't a lot of good um, secondary sources. Um, so this was uh, maybe a push uh, uh, to publish more for our scholars. <laughs> Um, to fill those gaps in the secondary research, uh, so that we can we can um, push it out to to the public through Wikipedia. Um, I think that's it. That's it for our slideshow. Thank you. This is Kira speaking. Uh, thanks so much, Sophie and Alicia, for that overview. Um, I want to bring in next. Carol, and I can read a little bit of Carol's bio, because um, Carol is uh, with us today and was one of the local experts that were able to be brought into this. So Carol McCann is professor of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at UMBC. Her publications include Birth Control Politics in the United States, 1916 to 1945, uh, on Cornell University Press, Figuring the Population Bomb, Gender and Demographic, de ge Gender and Demographic, hmm. 
demography. I can't say that word right now. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> In the mid 20th century, um, and also has been part of five editions of the Feminist Theory Reader. So, um, Carol, we'd love to hear your participation in all of this and also just, yeah, your experience. I'd be happy to talk about that. Thank you. Um, this is Carol speaking, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to participate today. Um, I learned a lot in um, working with um, Sophie and Alicia on this project, and I'm very grateful for them for reaching out to me, you know, out of the blue. Um, and I became involved because um, Alicia did reach out and I had heard over the years um, uh, quite a lot about gender bias in Wikipedia in an effort to get um, women's studies faculty involved and I had never taken it up. But when Alicia and Sh Sophie showed me the abortion in Maryland page as we met to talk about it, I was appalled and was then ready to be involved. Um, because I have done some work on um, local reproductive health care in the Baltimore region. Um, so I was happy to work with them in gathering sources, but Alicia did the lion's share of that work, I must say. Um, and I gave a, a brief talk about reproductive health care in the Baltimore area at the event because it's a long and complicated history that I, we thought it would be useful for people to have top of mind to be aware of as they were working. Um, and so this complemented the Baltimore Abortion Fund's um, brief in, um, discussion of like how to talk about abortion in this day and age. So to give you all a little bit of a sense of that complex um, and intersectional history, um, Baltimore has one of the oldest Planned Parenthood affiliates in the, the nation. It'll be 100 years old in um, 2027. 20, uh, but that is the case within um, a time period in a frame of racial segregation within the healthcare system of Maryland by law. Um, so there's this long and problematic relationship um, that still underlies healthcare disparities in the um, city that the Baltimore Abortion Fund is seeking to address. There's also this long- I'm sorry, Carol. I'm oh, sorry. We just yes. had um, a request to slow down a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I do apologize. Thank I you. talk too fast all the time, especially when I'm nervous. Um, so a long and complicated uh, reproductive health uh, history between uh, reproductive health care providers in the community and Johns Hopkins University and Hospital, uh, which has its own history of uh, racism in relationship to health care in the city. There's also um, a long history um, and pretty well documented history of illegal abortion in um, the Baltimore region that in fact produced a significant case before Roe v. Wade in the 1950s. And in 1984, the Annapolis Planned Parenthood Clinic was bombed by anti-abortion um, activists. So there's this a complicated set of things going on that we wanted people to be thinking about as we engage the history section of the history of, uh, of abortion in Maryland. Um, I, a couple of things that I learned from this uh, event was I didn't realize that one needed to use only published sources with Wikipedia. And so that um, that meant almost all of the resources I could have brought to the event were not uh, applicable because they're primary resources and held in archives. This helped me think differently about my relationship to public scholarship, my relationship to in community engagement. And Alicia and I have talked about you know, that we should we should target um, and publish on some of the topics we're not able and complexities we're not able to put into the Wikipedia page because there aren't secondary sources. Also, I think that this really um, 
was important for me to understand the value of this kind of activity for students. And so last fall, uh, my department had Alicia and Sophie um, come and do a workshop like this for students where they did training on how to do Wikipedia editing um, and encourage the students to think about how they could, um, with relative anonymity, be um, engaged in, in uh, improving public information systems. And I think for undergraduates, our undergraduates who are primarily members of my minoritized communities, um, the, the ability to be publicly engaged, but have some anonymity in terms of Wikipedia um, editing, I think was, was uh, very intriguing. And I know a couple of them have gone on to do some work on editing pages themselves. And I will turn it back to you all now. This is Kira. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, someone else who was involved in the event is with us today, so I want to invite them up. I'm going to read their bio uh, quickly. So Priya is a communications professional with a background in humanities and left-aligned issues. Their work has crossed paths with Pro-Choice Maryland, Repo Rising Virginia, the ACLU of Delaware, and most recently, the Baltimore Abortion Fund. At work, Priya has developed content and strategy for both digital and print platforms. She's partnered with nonprofit teams and coordinated with coalitions to spread awareness of available services and to galvanize support for a more just future. Outside of work, you can find Priya dreaming up interior designs and stitching away at her current fiber arts project. Priya, I'd love to invite you into the conversation to share a little bit about your involvement with this event and your experience. Yeah, sure. Um, this is Priya. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, at the time of this event, I was working for the Baltimore Abortion Fund as communications manager. Um, so BAF was one of a few, uh, a little handful of repro nonprofits that I've worked for. Um, so I do have a background generally in nonprofit communications, um, but my sort of niche is in uh, reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and so over the years, um, working for all these different repro nonprofits, um, I sort of I saw a lot of like variety in how people would talk about abortion, um, abortion access. And so um, that kind of prompted me to try and create some like structure and some standards in the roles that I was doing at these different organizations. Um, I think that there was also a sort of, at the time, honestly, generational um, difference in how people wanted to talk about abortions. Um, and people that I, people that I like associated with would genuinely like say that they wanted to prioritize what would make their like older wealthier donors happy and not really like what was considered the most inclusive thing um or like if they were going to say something inclusive then they also had to balance it out with something that was like maybe less inclusive um so there's a lot to unpack going on with language in the repro movement but what i brought to this event specifically was just a few sort of like quick guidelines, honestly, on how to talk about certain topics that often come up um, with abortion access, like um, whether there are gestational restrictions. Um, I'm sorry, and Priya, can you uh, slow down a little bit for interpretation? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yes. So talking about My apologies. When I lose my train of thought, I like fully lose my train of thought. Um, so I brought to this event a few sort of quicker guidelines on how to talk about um, a few topics that often come up um, when you're talking about abortion and especially when you're talking about abortion in Maryland. So um, there are a few clinics in Maryland and in D.C., that provide abortions later in pregnancy. Um, and as we all know, this is a huge, this is a huge topic of debate um, 
within political parties. It's come up in like every Republican primary, probably come up in all the Democratic ones too. Like it's an issue everywhere, but um, it also just doesn't really need to be regulated the way that it does um, because providers like abortion providers know how to provide health care. Like there's there's really no reason for abortion to be regulated the way that it is. Um, but the way that we talk about it sometimes justifies uh, the regulations or is like written by people who are trying to justify regulations. So whether we're saying things like uh, third trimester abortions, like third trimester isn't necessarily what some people are talking about as abortions later in pregnancy. Like there really is kind of just a spectrum here. Um, but yeah, so I brought to that event a few, a summary of a few different like topics of abortion. Another important one is non-gendered language to be inclusive of people of all genders who have abortions. Um, and so that's the, that was a big sort of like um, point of contention, I would say. Um, but uh, not at this event. <laughs> In my experience, it has been a huge point of contention. But um, that was another big uh, topic to unpack. But really, I was hoping to just give people a few tips um, going into this event, talking about um, on how to talk about abortion in a way that is like straightforward, um, like just getting to the point, but also being like the most inclusive um, and non-stigmatizing, honestly. This is Kira speaking. Thanks so much, Priya, for sharing. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, and sorry I didn't do this earlier, that Alicia, as noted in the chat, does have to drop off at two o'clock for another obligation. So um, just want to acknowledge that and thank you, Alicia, in advance. But for everyone else who's able to join us, um, we're going to start moving into a, a a question and answer, like really kind of an open discussion part. Um, so I'm going to kind of kick us off. But uh, from there, if you have questions that are surfacing, we would love to hear them. Um, but so my first question, and this is really for anyone on the panel who is um, interested or able to speak to it. So this year, Art and Feminism's theme for the year is solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. Uh, we're not all in this together, uh, where we call for a deeper reflection on what solidarity means uh, and what it looks like in practice and action. So what I'm thinking about with that theme and with this great event that you all did is like kind of bringing all your different expertise together. What does it mean to like build those bridges from various expertise and like what has been like if you could reflect on kind of the process of working together in this way. I know Alicia has to leave, so I don't know if you have time, if you if you want to chime in before you leave or I can I can chime in very briefly. This is Alicia. Um I think that's a great question and it kind of allows us to build on some of the things that we mentioned uh in our in our little presentation, um, I think bridging the sort of world of scholarly research and history and groups like Baltimore Abortion Fund, which are doing the work on the ground, um, is like is exciting for everyone involved. Um, and again, I think the people who attended the event were excited about the process of normalizing abortion is something that has always been part of our lives and in the specific place where we live has always been practiced. Um, and so I think that was a great experience of solidarity across, you know, sort of people with different areas of expertise and people who work in different areas. Um, and thanks again for hosting this event. It was really lovely. All right, farewell. This is Kira. Thanks, Alicia. Sophie or Carol or Priya, do you want to have anything to add? Um, well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, this is Carol speaking. One of the things I recall from the event was a number of the community members 
um, a pretty good number, so a por proportion of the community members came up to me during the event to thank me for giving the historical background because it, it was all stuff they didn't know. Um, and this is something that my students, when I teach on this topic, talk about is that they're just angry that they hadn't had an opportunity to learn this, any of this history before they, in anywhere in their education. And so I think it's really impressed upon me as a scholar, the ways in which I can sort of help think about moving some of these suppressed histories around reproductive justice out into a broader community. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that I just really appreciate the intergenerational um, sort of collaboration between Sophie, um, Priya, Kira, Alicia, Mary and I that brought together, you know, um, historically situated differences of perspective and thinking about how do we address those um, so that the donor class and the user class have more in uh, common shared understandings. I would add to that, that I think each one of us, we all learned a lot from each other um, I, I, beyond sort of information. Sorry, this is Sophie speaking. So beyond, um, you know, just sort of receiving information um, or giving it, I I learned so much from uh, it. It required an, an element of humbleness, I think, on my behalf. I didn't know a lot of what Priya was sharing about language use. Um, I know that um, I taught, you know, and. Uh, Carol and, and Alicia and I have talked about this, but there's some editing um, things that, you know, I think, and it made me, val it, I, I felt like um, I, I brought valuable skills and I also was, it was so great to like receive, um, you know, from other people's expertise in different areas. Um, I, yeah, and I, um, I'll, I'll pass it along to Priya. Um, thank you for passing that along to me. Um, yeah, I and I think like what you're saying about um, being open to learning and receiving new information, I was definitely feeling that too because um, I was not, not a big history learner in school and I feel like I probably should have been. But um, I... Uh, I mean, part of why I have gotten into this like niche of repro communications is because it is like it is so niche and it's like such a very specific, like singular type of healthcare that you're talking about because it's been singled out so much that people people don't just like know about it, just like not being super familiar with it. So um, when you're working in an advocacy organization, um, representing uh, not just like users of the services, abortion seekers, um, but also uh, like providers of health care, um, you have to you have to understand what their language is and you have to understand um, what people like what your audience will understand um but also still what embodies the values that your organization is trying to uphold and that's looked different at every repro organization that i've worked for um but yeah i think the uh the intergenerational stuff has always been fantastic um when everybody is chill about it uh the, the donor class is sometimes a different story but um, I was fortunate to have like a great time at this event, um, and to not have had too many horrible donor interactions in my experience. This is Kira. Thanks, Priya. I mean, reflecting a little bit on what you're saying, it is both wild that we have this whole thing about very basic healthcare, um, and 
also it's great and exciting that we are having the space to talk about this very basic health care. So it's kind of multiple truths happening at once. Um, as part of the theme this year that I mentioned earlier, we wrote that we invite you to learn with us as we unpack solidarity and how can we transform banner statements into action. Um, and so that actually leads me to a question that came up in the chat, which was, how long was this process of putting this engagement together? Um, talking more about timeline, um, noting that I can tell a lot of great work and intentionality went into this. So if you could talk a little bit about taking, I know Sophie and Alicia talked about how you brought it together, but what, give us a peek behind the curtain in times of uh, terms of timeline. Well, this is Sophie speaking. Um... Alicia and I had been talking for a long time, like years, about um, me uh, coming to a class that she teaches about um, healthcare access and helping her students and some kind of Wikipedia project. Um, so in that sense, like the idea has been bubbling for many, many years. Um, and, but I think, so the, the edit-a-thon uh, occurred in January 2023, and I think, Carol, you're going to have to help me remember some key dates, but I believe Alicia reached out to you maybe a couple months or or so, oh. maybe two or three months before that. Is yeah. that right? I, I think it was October. In October, Okay. So I think um, from October to January, we were sort of getting all of our our ducks in a row or all of our um, our the pieces of the puzzle put together. Um, yeah, so we, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question or if you'd like some more details. This is Kira. No, I think that answers timeline. Um, but going back to this greater idea of transforming banner statements into action, is there an action or takeaway that you would hope that people who are attending this conversation today or viewing it in the future, um, like what action or takeaway would you be hopeful for? That's a this is Sophie. That's a great question. Um, I think as Alicia was saying earlier, um, I will admit that I have a little, I get a, I, though I'm a librarian and I'm very used to engaging with our uh, subject experts, our, our, our scholarly experts at my institution, I am a little, I do get a little nervous about um, approaching um uh you know experts um but i think alicia made a great point earlier that um uh folks that are in engaged in this kind of scholarship want to share it with the public and will be are not intimidating carol you're not intimidating <laughs> um and will be um you'll likely find um game partners in, in this work. Um, and um, I'll, I'll pass it on to either Carol or Priya. Um, I, I can add to that a little bit. Uh, well, a couple of things. One, I, this is Carol speaking. I um, also um, have been intrigued and taken up the, the um, issue of how can we inform people um, of this as a practice to, because there are 49 other states with inadequate um, Wikipedia pages about abortion history in their states. And, and so we've done a couple of presentations to sort of to, to my, and to my scholarly communities to think about this. Um, uh, I was going to say something else, but I've lost my train of thought. Um, so, oh, I know what it was going to be. Uh, as Priya was saying, this is a very niche area. And so 
Um, for those of you who are interested in, in thinking about reaching out to scholars and other um, policy people, anybody working on these kinds of issues, it don't, they are often the, the one person in their university, the one person in their community organization that, that are focused on this. And so this is a great way to build community. Um, so I feel it's very nice to be able to have the other people involved in this project um, as people who I know of, who are local, who care about these issues, who um, I can collaborate with on other things. And turn it over to Priya. Um, yeah, I would say uh, my general call to action would always probably be like donate to local abortion funds in the South. Um, they really are doing the on the ground work of like mobilizing people. Um, Florida, especially, I would say the abortion funds there are doing great work. Um, Arc Southeast is amazing. Um, th but those are just a couple. Um, and an AF has a directory of all of them. Um, uh, sorry, this is Priya to clarify. Um, yeah, and I would say to do with like language and trying to do what's the most inclusive and respectful um, and also accurate. Um, I would say just like be open to new ideas. Like I, I was an English major during my undergrad. And so one of the things you learn is that language is always changing. Um, and so if language is always changing to make it work the best way for us, then like we can be the ones to change it and like adapt to new things. Um, and so I've kind of learned about that through just like being open to learning new things, um, being open to like listening to other advocates and um, seeing what other people say and taking that into consideration too. Mrs. Kira, thanks Priya. And I see that both Sophie and I popped in some links for abortion funds, if that um, is some action that you're able to take. And then I wanna pass it over to Oscar for a question. Thank you, really great uh, conversation. As someone that is about to plan something similar, uh, really similar to this uh, in Texas in a few months, I want to know more about uh, what, what was the reception in the online community? Do you were able to edit articles from the scratch? Like, uh, or only uh, do edit content already existing? I mean, question is uh, regarding on the, I don't know, the backlash that you're going to face if your article is going to leader or something. I want to know more about that. <clears throat> Uh, my second question is, uh, you were able to track the if the participant continue editing in the future after the editathon ends, uh, you were able to see if people stay around or continue editing in other topics or gender topics or reproductive rights topics. Uh, so yeah, um, and also I'm going to act that like I'm really uh, interesting to connect with art and feminists <laughs> to do this editathon in a few months. So probably going to see an email from me. <laughs> Thank you. This is Sophie. Definitely connect with art and feminism. And I think Kira and Nina have some contacts. If I don't know where in Texas you are, but we've got some a couple of great people in Houston um, that would be great collaborators. Um, I uh, wish Alicia was here because I I think our edits were mostly, so each of the abortion in state, uh, the state level abortion pages that Women in Red created uh, are uh, sort of follow the same template and a lot of the information is, is, is the same. Um, sort of national level information. Um, so you can you can look at what we did on the abortion in Maryland page and compare it to um, the abortion in Texas page as it exists now. 
um, to get an idea of some sort of the evolution of the page. Um, and um, I I believe, so I uh, I think most of our, I don't, I don't think we had much um, drama on the, in the talk, you know, <laughs> in the talk page, but I do know that Alicia had, she was engaged in some sort of back and forth with another editor on some small point for a while. And I can't quite remember what this it is, was. This is you Carol. Know? And I remember because it, it, tied, it does tie directly with what um, Priya was talking about that um, people were pushing back on the inclusive language that Alicia had used in the header to describe abortion seekers mm. and wanting to gen regender that in, um, in a way that is not inclusive. And um, and when, uh, as my memory is when Alicia sent that person um, some something, some slides from what Priya had done, then they then they accepted. They backed off. They backed off. Yeah. Thank you, Priya. Ooh. Yeah, and I think um, I think when you when you show somebody a resource like that, and like they they see sort of like reasoning for it, like a lot of the times people will be open to just like changing or at least just like letting it go um even if it's not what they like want to want to necessarily do um but yeah um people generally have good intentions and um are open to changing their minds if you just uh give them the resources on a really niche subject well you know and as an example i think um it had not occurred to me until that that abortion saying abortion seekers was not only much more inclusive but really quite specific in terms of making us think about the actions necessary to um access abortion so i use abortion seekers now all the time thank you priya sorry this was carol speaking again This is Kira. I think it's it's so important that you know it, we can say it, but it's true. Language matters, so it's it's very important, and it does have an impact. So, thank you for all of your work on that. And um, Oscar, we're obviously all very excited about your event. So please <laughs> get in touch. Um, while some other questions might be per percolating, I did want to share because I thought it would be interesting to also just kind of show some of the, the actual outcomes from this very exciting um, event that that took place in the terms of, uh, you know, tangibly the dashboard. So this was the dashboard from the event in which we are talking about. Um, so just in terms of the words added, um, how many times the article has been viewed, it's, you know, it's pretty powerful to see that this article that was worked on by 32 editors had, um, has over 400,000 views. So just kind of reinforcing, you know, the power of what this editing can do. Nina. Um, I just wanted to add, because I know Oscar was also asking about kind of like what happens after the edit-a-thon, and I think um, Sophie brought up um, how they got together again afterwards to do a little bit of cleanup, but I think in general something um, that we have learned around like retention in this work is having, planning for a follow-up is always a good idea. Um, because you get started and then it feels like there's not a lot of time and um, knowing that you can tell people, hey, we're going to do this again next week, Saturday at this time and you can drop in or here's how you can follow up um, with us. Um, a lot of Wikimedians use like Telegram or have different group chats for people to kind of continue the conversation if you can't meet again in person. So just wanted to recommend those things. Also, all of those things that are mentioned in the video that I linked to in the chat um, from our conversation yesterday on collective editing. So um, really excited to hear more from you, Oscar, but wanted to add that in. 
Another thing that I'll just jump on what Nina was saying about our event yesterday, and forgive me for screen sharing again, but um, the event that we did yesterday really focused on translating existing pages, uh, recognizing, of course, or that this event that we're talking about today was held in English and we were working on English Wikipedia about abortion in Maryland, but also recognizing that English is not the only language spoken in in uh, Maryland and also that, you know, there might be abortion seekers or people who are looking for information about abortion in Maryland who don't speak English. And so the, one of the things we did yesterday in our event is we really focused on translating pages. So this is another action I guess everyone could consider is um, why not translate the abortion in Maryland page to another language and making that information even more accessible uh, to a wider population. This is Sophie. I just want to say that's an amazing idea. That's awesome. And this is Kira. The thing that was pretty exciting to me yesterday, um, I had never worked with the translator tool before, but it's actually pretty powerful. Um, and then there's also, I mean, not perfect, but there's Set sites like DeepL that are pretty powerful AI translation tools too, to just even make that information even more accessible. We are arriving near the end of our time, so I just wanted to make space for other questions. Um, if there are any, you can raise your hand, you can put them in the chat if you would like me to read it. Uh, I will, um, not to put you on the spot, but Chris, I was wondering if you would feel comfortable unmuting to talk a little bit about the tool, the Wiki, Wikipedia library tool that you had mentioned in the chat. I think it's it would be pretty cool to share about if you're comfortable unmuting. Yeah, uh, this is Chris uh, and Kira, thank you for the invitation. So um, er earlier, if folks were following chat, um, I had mentioned that um, there is a service that the Wikimedia Foundation offers called the Wikipedia Library, where um, editors who have uh, a little bit of history with editing and have had recent activity are generally eligible to join this service. And what it is, is it's a service that permits access to a number of um, uh, literary databases, uh, some academic leaning, some uh, focused on other kinds of works and publications, um, and, and allows folks to use those um, those databases to get access to sources that they may need to help work on um, articles and topics, uh, 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 you know, generally in Wikipedia, but also in other Wikimedia projects as well. Um, in addition to that, I had also noted there is um, on English Wikipedia. Um, and, and probably this exists on other Wikimedia projects as well. And so if folks are wondering, I can look into other uh, specific Wikimedia projects um, in addition. Um, there often are resource exchange um, boards on many Wikimedia projects to support editors who do have access to um, these sources, uh, e either through the Wikipedia library or more personally, to be able to share copies of you know, sources um, usually, you know, that are somewhat reasonable in scope um, with other editors who might be seeking, say, maybe you found a snippet of a book on Google Books that you want to be able to get more full, you know, get that full context on to be able to work that into an article that you or maybe others are working on. Uh, this is a place where you can make that request. And if an editor, you know, happens to be able to get access to that source, either through, you know, the library, the Wikipedia library, or other, other means, they uh, can and, and ha often do try to, you know, provide that to you. Um, and so there are some volunteers active on those boards um, who are able to, you know, get those requests um, to folks who, who make them if they're, you know, looking for a source they don't have access to. Um, but have a, a you know <laughs> know that it's going to be useful for them for one reason or another around the, their their active editing work. So just wanted to bring attention to those sources. Um, I'll, I'll put those links again here in chat. Um, and um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm I I didn't really introduce myself. <laughs> I'm, so I'm Chris Schilling on the community resources team at the Wikimedia Foundation. 
Um, if folks would like to chat more with me about the Wikipedia library, I can um, introduce you to some of my colleagues at the foundation if you have more questions about the service. Uh, thanks, Kira. This is Kira. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I want to, of course, thank the panelists today for joining us, sharing about their experience and, you know, mostly putting on a really rad event that just really is so exciting to see so many kind of cross institutions coming together and really creating such a impactful event. So we're really thankful for your work. We're thankful for you sharing your expertise with us today and your experience. Um, I want to highlight a couple things that we have coming up at Art and Feminism. So we have an editing workshop on February 24th. This will be in Spanish. Um, and then we have another editing workshop in uh, a couple more editing workshops coming up in English. One will be on International Women's History Day. It'll be about writing about art. Um, and then we're going to have another one on the 28th. Uh, for movement workers and organizers. We're all excited about all these upcoming spaces to be editing together. And then we are also gonna have another conversation, Collective Imagination and Radical Futures, talking with the Kansas City organizers on making art and building power. So just wanna put those on your radar. I'm sure Nina's dropping some links in the chat about these things. Um, and really join our campaign, get in touch, use our resources. We want to be editing and organizing with you. And then if we could kind of just close out our time together, um, I think just with like some collective breaths uh, just to kind of close, close it out. So uh, you can close your eyes, you can not, you can hand on your heart or on your lap, stand, turn off your camera, whatever feels right in your heart. Uh, we'll do three breaths together, okay? So breathe in and out. In again and out. And one more time, in and out. Thank you all again for spending some time with us today. We hope you had um, learned some things, enjoyed the conversation, and we hope to see you at an editing table soon. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are.